just as in 6.1, because the binomial probability distribution is a probability distribution, that means that it has a mean and a standard deviation, just as would any distribution. There's a formula for it because binomial random variables follow very particular patterns. And so the formula for the mean is really simple. It's just n times p. And the formula for standard deviation is not much more difficult. It's the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. Or if you like, that's also equal to the square root of n p q, as some books would have it. So I'll just write that down. I think we actually use that version later anyway. All right, so we can use that to be able to answer questions we've always answered about the mean and the standard deviation, like interpretation and pieces like that. One thing to keep in mind is that these formulas are right here in the table, the big binomial table in your exam notes packet. For some reason, a lot of students forget that they're there, and they're very simple. They're right there, the mean and the standard deviation. They'll only work if it's binomial, but a lot of things will be binomial, perhaps, so it'll be nice to know. All right, so yet again, we have our poor hapless student that took their multiple choice test that had 10 questions, each of which has five choices, only one of which is correct. The student guessed randomly at each answer, right? We've seen this set up before. Here's a histogram of the probability distribution from this binomial experiment. And you can, well, we'll talk about those, right? That's actually the answer down here to the last question. All right, so we're gonna compute the mean of the distribution and label on the graph, and we're gonna compute the standard deviation. Now, I didn't give any space, um, I probably should have given a little space, but it's because it's so easy. N, you'll see right here, is 10. See right here? And P, the probability of success, is 0.2 because it's one-fifth, right? So when you want the mean, you want NP, I'll, just, I'll, I'll show the work right over here. The mu of X is NP, which is 10 times one-fifth, or 10 times 0.2, which is two. So the answer is two, right here. And it's right there on the graph, see it? That's the mean number correct. X is the number of correct questions, and that's the mean number that we expect. All right, the standard deviation, um, I didn't have any, I guess I have room for it right here. Sigma sub x is the square root of n p q, or n p times one minus p. So that's 20 times 0.81, and then one minus 0.81. And you can just type it like that, or you can find what one minus 0.81 is, it's 0.19 and do it that way, whatever. All right, so let me grab the calculator, just so you can see me do this typing. Or you could use Dasmos, either one would work. So 10 times 1 fifth is in fact two, just in case you didn't believe me. Oh, no, I meant 10 here, not 20. Oh my goodness, sorry about that. 10 is 10. Okay, so if I take 10 times 1 fifth, I was doing 0.81 from that previous problem. I don't know what I was doing. Sorry, 10 times 1 fifth. Sorry about that. And 1 minus 1 fifth. I was still stuck on that, that coronary bypass problem. There we go. All right, so 10 times 1 fifth times 4 fifths, which is what 1 minus a fifth would be. Or if you like, um, 10 times 1 fifth times, and you can use parentheses, 1 minus 1 fifth. That would be there, and then you just have to take the square root of it. So you can take the square root of that answer, like this, square root of that answer, or you could take square root from the start. Take the square root, then type 10 times 1 fifth times parentheses 1 minus 1 fifth. There you go. Oh, except I did a division sign in there. There you go. So 10 times 1 fifth times 1 minus 1 fifth, all underneath that square root, and there you have it. 0.126, or 1.26, uh, 5, roughly. And any graphing calculator will do, we almost always use this TI-84 or StatCrunch. So there you have it. Now what does that mean? That means that the student randomly guessing on this test should expect to get
uh, test or quiz. Um, you have to put the how many questions there are at one point or other. So I either put it now on this test with 10 questions. I either put it here or I put it later. So with 10 questions, random, student randomly guessing on this test with 10 questions should expect to get or would expect to get two questions correct. Give or take 1.265 questions. All right, there's a new component to this that we haven't really had before. We have our mean right here. Um, let me do it in pink here. So you have your mean right here, and you have to write the word expectation, of course, because that's what the mean is. Remember, expected value, that's still there. Give or take, and then there's your sigma right there, your give or take and your sigma. And then up here, you have to have context, but you also, for the first time ever, have to put in your N because N has to be there. Make a little star or something. You need to have it, and you have not needed that before for interpretation, but it has to be there for binomial problems because otherwise you're saying, I expect to get two questions correct. Out of how many? Out of 50? Out of 70? What are we talking about here? So you have to say out of 10, right? You have to put your N value in there. So that's a new component. So that's part of your context. Your context has to include your N. Right, star it, circle it, right? N has to be there, right? All right, now review question. What is the shape of this distribution? That is skewed right. That has a tail to the right. And why would that make sense? Well, because we, we don't expect the student to get a lot of questions correct. It would be unusual for them to get seven, eight, or nine, ten correct, right? We expect, um, if the student, and think about this, pretend it's not just one student. Pretend it's, you know, 500 students. We expect most of them to get very few correct, right? The bulk of it should be over here. It would be an outlier, a very unusual tail to be on this high side, right? So we expect very few questions correct. So that's where the, the bulk of the histogram is. And it would be highly unlikely to be on the high side. Right, that's why there's, well, almost no space over here. You can see 7, 8, 9, 10 are blank. So it would be very unusual to have many correct. Now, are 7, 8, 9, and 10 zero as they appear on the graph is the next question. Because when you look at them on the graph, they look like they're blanks. So are they? So these values right here, see how they don't look like anything? That's what that's asking about. Why do they look like nothing? Why is it that there's no bar drawn? They're not zero, right? We've actually proven that. We've already seen these probabilities. So are these probabilities zero, right? Is the probability of seven questions correct? So it's asking specifically, I should say, about seven. It's not asking about all of them. I apologize. So it's really asking about seven, specifically this one. But it's true of eight, nine, and ten as well. They're not zero, right? We could actually find them. Heck, I could find the probability of seven with my calculator pretty quickly. Right? The probability of seven would be, or seven correct, would be binome PDF. It'd be ten, one-fifth, and seven. There it is. It's point zero 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 seven eight six. So the probability that X is seven is binome PDF. And of course you could find that with stack crunch as well. So ten one fifth seven is seven point eight six four E negative four, which is zero point zero 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 seven eight six. It's not zero. And similarly, it would be that way for 8, 9, and 10. There's numbers there. The problem is that the probabilities are so low that the computer can't draw them. 
probability is so small, the bar cannot be drawn by the computer. And if you will, the line that makes up the x-axis is actually taller than that bar would be. That thin, thin line, that probability is less than that. That's how small that probability is. All right, now last but not least, let's remember one more thing about the mean. The mean, remember from chapters three, the mean is a balance point. It's where you would balance the graph. And if it was on a teeter-totter, if it was on a lever or a seesaw, you can see it right here. That mean is that balance point. It's where this graph would balance. And we're going to use that fact to answer the last example. We have three graphs that are binomial that are drawn with n is equal to 100 for all of them. Which graph represents the probability of success is 0.3, which one is 0.5, and which one is 0.7, explain. Okay, so I think the top one's 0.5, but I'm gonna prove it. The mean is NP. So that would be 100 times 0.5, which would mean 50. And 50 made no sense because that wasn't on this graph. I just went back and looked at the program and it was a mistake. It was 15. Sorry about that. So n is 15. Sorry. 15 times 0.5. Well, let's find out. It would be 7.5, I believe, but let me find it. Sorry about that typo. So it's 7.5 right here. So this is 7.5. And sure enough, look, 7.5, that's the middle zone. Right? So that's the balance point. I mean, another way to think about it, how did I know, even with the typo, that this was the one that was p equals 0.5? Well, because it's evenly split, right? It's 50-50. It's evenly balanced. This one's symmetric. So that's how I knew this one had to be the 7.5. It had to be the p equals 0.5, which is what was being specifically asked for. So there's p equals 0.5. Done. All right, now what about 0 0.7 and 0 0.3? Keeping in mind this is out of 15. Sorry about that mistake. So, well, I don't know, but I think this one's going to be on the high side. If I look at it, see it's a 10. So if I say the mean is NP, if I try 15 times 0 0.7, 15 times 0 0.7 would be 10.5, which sure enough, is the balance point right there, right? It's on the high side right there. Now, how did I know it without even knowing the answer for the mean? Because I didn't. I knew this one had to be P equals 0 0.7 because if it's out of 15, I have more successes. Look, I'm on the high side for successes, 10, successes, 11, 12. That's 0.7 for my probability of success, not 0.3, right? But another way to think about it is the balance point. That's the easiest way, right? You have a lot of successes. You're going to be on the high side, right? As opposed to this one, look, at that's the low side. Because NP, which is your mean, would be 15 times 0.3, which I believe would be 4.5. But let me double check. Sure enough, 4.5. And that's why that's the balance point right there. That's your mean. So you can see they were asking which one is which. This one's the p equals 0.3. It has a lot of low successes because you have a low probability of success. So your low values down here. This one is 0.7 because you have a lot of high successes. You have a high chance of success. So this one right here is 0.7. Right? Highest chance of success means high values for your x values. This one's the middle ground because it's evenly split, perfectly symmetric. And then the low chance of success is 0.3. Oops, that highlighter keeps dying on me. I'm going to have to get rid of it. 0.3 right there. And that's this one right here, 0.3.